I'm so excited. It's good to be back. I was in uh, the Northeast, New Jersey, New York, Connecticut, uh, last weekend ministering. Had tremendous, tremendous outpouring of the Holy Spirit. Amen. People were, were born again. People were baptized in the Holy Spirit. God did what only he does. And, and we continually just are carrying out what God is doing here into other places. How many know the church you're a part of here is bigger than what's in this room? Amen. It's bigger than the walls of this building. God uses us in our city, in our nation, in the nations of the earth. And everything we do, you're a part of it. Amen. How many were blessed by the message, stay in your lane, last week? My sister, amen. Angela Fox, some of you don't know she's my sister, amen. You don't know, it's just like, just because you're like, wow, how could, how could somebody, that beautiful, just be related to somebody that looks like that, I tell you what. But, but you know what? God has got a lot of grace, and that's what I'm preaching on today, amen. A lot of grace, a lot of grace. So, we're going to jump into the Word of God. His word transforms the human heart. How many know only the word of God has the power to deal with the human condition? How many know our willpower, strength, ability does not, can't deal with our condition? How many know politics can't deal with the human condition? We have to have God's word to come. And so part of our worship is giving attention to God's word. I want you to get ready to focus in today because we've been in a series called Limitless Grace. We've been talking about the grace of God. We did several weeks talking about faith, about dangerous faith. Now we're talking about limitless grace because the two of those things work together like partners. Grace and faith. Amen? And God's grace is inexhaustible. It has no limits. It's the most important spiritual quality that you can understand. Without grace, we're nothing because grace is God's expression to me. It's the thing that gives me every breath I breathe is the grace of God. Without grace, we can do nothing. We don't accomplish anything. We don't get anywhere without grace. But when you are operating in grace, nothing is impossible. Why? Because it comes under the power of God. Somebody shout grace. We have to know that God's grace is working in us. It is God's fundamental expression toward us. That's why it has no limits. Not only that, grace has the power to transform us. It takes us from where we are to where we need to be. So today I want to give you a message. and I want to speak to you a word from the Lord about moving from disgrace to grace. How many know there's a lot of people living in disgrace? But God did not create you to live in disgrace. He created you to live in grace. So today we're going to move from disgrace to grace. Turn in your Bibles to Isaiah chapter 61. Isaiah chapter 61, a powerful chapter on the redemption of God for everyone that believes in him. A powerful prophetic, uh, historically powerful prophetic word about the redemptive nature of Christ. I want to take one verse out of this chapter, and we're going to start with that verse today. Isaiah 61 and verse 7. If you have your Bibles open to that, put your hand right on the Word. If you don't, just put your hand over your heart today. Lord, we thank you for your Word that comes to transform us. We thank you for your grace that's unlimited. We thank you, God, that you're leading us down a path. God, that you're pushing us towards a destiny. And Lord, I just thank you, God, for what you're doing in our lives and our hearts. In Jesus' name, amen. Isaiah 61, verse 7. Instead of your shame, you shall have double honor. And instead of confusion... They shall rejoice in their portion. Therefore, in their land, they shall possess double, and everlasting joy shall be theirs. Come on, I want you to read it this way. Say, instead of my shame, I will have double honor. Instead of my confusion, I will rejoice in my portion. In my land, I will possess double, 
and everlasting joy will be mine. How many know it's powerful when you make it personal? Amen. A lot of times when you read the Bible, if you will make the scripture personal to you, it will do something on the inside of you when you read it. So today God wants to take you from where you are to where he wants you to be. I have a question for you. What is between you and where God is taking you? What is the one thing that is standing between you and the place that God is bringing you to? This is very important. You have to know because that's where grace has to be applied in your life. Grace, the power and ability of God. Isaiah gives us this powerful prophecy in Isaiah 61. He said, instead of your shame, or you could say instead of your disgrace, you will have double honor. We read that in John that he gives us grace upon grace. Because we talked about grace having levels, right? So in place of your disgrace, God will give you a double portion of grace. I love it because God doesn't just give us one thing equaling another thing. How many know that God gives us abundantly above what we could ask or think, the Bible says. Right? Instead of confusion, disgrace, you will rejoice in your portion, grace. When you get to your land, in other words, when you're walking into the place God has called you to walk, when you're walking in your purpose, you will possess double. Who wants to possess double? Amen? You get to your place by walking in grace. I said that this morning in the first service. I didn't even know it rhymed. And I said it. And I said, wow, that's powerful. Come on, say that. Say, I get to my place by walking in grace. That's a powerful truth. You get to your destination when you're walking in the grace of God in your life. So if you want to possess double, if you want to go to another level in your life, if you want to come to another level in your ability, if you want to come to another level in your fruitfulness, you have to come to a place of grace. Grace will bring you double for your trouble. Come on, why? God is a God of abundance, and that will bring you into everlasting joy. The finish line of, ra of the race of grace, the finish line is called joy. It's joy. How many know the Bible says one day you'll stand before God and you want to hear these words, well done, my good and faithful servant, enter into the joys of the Lord. Now, if we look at our own efforts and abilities and how well we've done, I don't know that any of us would say, I measure up to being well done, my good and faithful servant. I feel like there's things that I haven't done well. Let me tell you the secret to hearing those words from the voice of the Lord. And he tells you to enter into joy, cross the finish line of grace. Let me tell you, it comes through grace. You can't have a well done life without grace coming to do in you and through you what you can't do yourself. So when you come into everlasting joy, you're coming into everlasting joy at the end of a race called grace. If you just try to run it in your human efforts, you'll have too many stumbles, you'll have too many falls. You come in and God looks at you and he doesn't see grace and he says, depart from me. I never knew you. I don't know who you are. But when he sees himself in you, he recognizes you. That's a whole message in itself that I'm not preaching today. But that's powerful. The problem is we get stuck in the variableness of our life and character. Why? Because we step outside of grace and we start walking in the works of our flesh and abilities till we get frustrated. And then when we are frustrated, then we finally cry out to God and God gives us what? Grace. And we step back up, but then what do we do? We take back over again with the works of our flesh. So there's a variable. There's a spiritual roller coaster that many of us are on, that battle between grace and my human effort. And we have to understand that grace is the exact opposite of the works of my human effort, right? To the degree that 
you walk in your own strength is to the degree that you walk outside of grace. You have to understand that. Peter in the Bible, and I love Peter, he's one of my favorite disciples. He is a great example. Peter actually was not his name. His name was Simon. Peter was a nickname that Jesus gave to him. And Peter, the name Jesus gave to him, is a name that means little stone. Cephas is the word. It means rock. It represents something in the nature of stability. Jesus was connecting Peter's identity to his identity when he said, Upon this rock I will build my church and the gates of hell will not prevail against it. So when you understand what Jesus was doing, he wasn't speaking into the natural nature of Peter. He was speaking into the destination of Peter. He was speaking into the identity that God had created in him, even though that identity was not always visible, right? You have to understand the variableness of Peter because what you see in Peter depends on when you see him. How many have been that person before? What you see depends on when you're looking at me. Whether I'm walking in faith and I'm serving God and I'm worshiping or whether I'm over here down in the dumps in the, in the pit of despair, barely making it, right? What you see depends on when you look at me. That was Peter, right? That was Peter. At one moment, he's solid and stable. He's strong and committed. He, he's, he's brave. He faces the soldiers with tenacity. He pulls out the sword and takes a swing, probably trying to cut the guy's head off. He misses. He gets the ear. But he was prepared to die for the Lord. The next moment, people are confronting him about his relationship with Jesus, and he gets angry and starts swearing, and he says, I don't know him. I had nothing to do with him. That variableness. Why is it important to understand this? Because you can try to ignore what I'm about to say, but the reality is all of us have inconsistencies. All of us deal with variableness. We all deal with that nature that Peter dealt with. And my frustration with the church is that we seem obligated to be shocked at other people's failures. It's like we are, we're, we are somehow feel like we're supposed to be shocked and angry at somebody else's weakness. I wish the day would come that we could just be real. Come on, just be real about the way we... Re Most people that see a scandal, the only difference between them and the people in the scandal is timing and getting caught. Come on, we've all done... You might not be doing it anymore, but you've done some stuff. You hear what I'm saying? And how many know if we got caught for everything that we did, we'd be in a lot more trouble than we like to admit. Amen? But we vacillate. We tend to go back and forth and back and forth. It's like the weather. Back when it was cold, everybody couldn't wait for it to be summer. Just a few months later, everybody's complaining because of how hot it is. Right? And that same effect, it comes into our spiritual life. It's easy to forget where you came from. It's easy for God's grace to get you somewhere, and then you look at somebody else's life and judge their lack of grace. Mm. Just say, mm. That means I could say more, but I'm not going to. Amen? And so it's easy to forget the stuff we did. And then we have no grace for other people's failures and mistakes. They screw up, no grace for you. Ow. You know? That's what we live like. And I was talking, actually I was talking to Craig Lawrence this week, and, and we were actually talking about this, and, and he was saying, you know what? It, it's like the way chickens treat each other. And I started reading about chickens after that conversation. And the more I read about chickens, the more I thought I was reading about church people. I really was. Listen, I, let me, I'm going to give you some of the stuff I read. How many know chickens are not the smartest creatures in the animal kingdom? They will peck at and even kill each other to gain position. Not only that, chickens will especially attack wounded chickens. If one chicken in the flock is wounded, the others will start pecking at it until they kill it. Because chickens are attracted to blood. That's why if you raise chickens, if a chicken dies, you have to remove that chicken as soon as possible, the dead chicken. right? Because it will start a series of, 
of effects that will cause the chickens to start attacking each other. Not only that, chickens imitate each other. What one chicken does, the other chickens start doing. So when some, one starts aggressively pecking at another, they all come together and start pecking together at that one. The others follow. You know chickens can even be cannibals? They can even eat other chickens. And it can result in a whole destruction of a chicken community. When I started reading this stuff, I said, my goodness, we are way too much like chickens. God did not call us to be chickens. He didn't say, you're my chickens. He said, you're sheep. Amen? Amen. We got to act like sheep, not like chickens. I don't want to be scratching with the chickens anyway. He called us to soar with the eagles. Amen? Amen. That means, but if we're going to do that, we have to have a huge dose of grace because as soon as I start operating, acting, and reacting to people in the flesh, I start acting like a chicken. And I start pecking my way to position and pecking people that are hurting and, and, and joining with the others to peck at this one so nobody pecks at me. That's how we act if we're not walking in grace as believers. Amen. The grace you extend to others has a direct correlation with your place and purpose in God. It does. Until you understand what I'm teaching about grace, it affects your ability to find your place in God. How you see God affects how you see other people. And how you see other people affects how you see you. And so we need a big dose of grace to deal with all of it. So we understand how to see God, we understand how to see each other, and we understand how to see ourselves. The problem is, is that when we see somebody great, somebody that God's grace is on, we tend to deify those people. If it's a great leader, if it's an anointed person, if it's a person that, that is in the Bible, Apostle Paul, Peter, we tend to deify these people. But deifying great people distances your possibility of becoming one. That was good. I'm going to say that again. Deifying great people distances your possibility of becoming one. As long as you deify people, leaders, biblical characters, and put them in a special class or a special category somewhere beyond you, you put yourself in a position where you believe that you are not like them. But if you look at any great leader, any great person in the world, what you're going to find out is they had weaknesses. They had some big failures. They had to learn to trust God, just like we did. And everything they became, they actually became because of grace, because of God's ability, right? And because we're just like each other. We are men of like passions. We deal with the same stuff, the same temptations. And I believe the power of God is always exhibited in the framework of God doing so much with so little. What God does in people says a lot more about God than it does about the person. Right? God is a master craftsman. He can take a lump of clay and turn it into a work of art. He can take a lump of clay and turn it into a beautiful vessel. When God made man, he didn't reach into the gold and the silver of the earth and breathe into the gold. He took a handful of dirt and breathed the breath of life. He took the most base material of the earth and breathed his life into it. And man became a living soul. You know what's so ridiculous about all of our divisions and fighting with each other in our culture and our world? It's one piece of dirt thinking they're better than the other piece of dirt. How many know we're all just lumps of dirt and we aren't anything except that God breathed life into us? Isn't that great? If we understand that, it's real easy to walk in unity with each other. Amen? God would use such base material to blow his majesty into. Let you know something about his ability. Let you know something about his ability to get you where you need to be. 
The sooner you realize this, the more you're going to unlock the grace for your potential. The more you're going to step into the person that God has called you to be. Let's look at this together. Turn in your Bibles to Romans chapter 5. I love the book of Romans when it talks about grace. Romans chapters 5, 6, 7, and 8 are four of the greatest chapters on grace and redemption. We set this year at the beginning of the year. I call this year the year of redemption. How many have had some redemption this year? How many still waiting for some redemption this year? The year's not over. Amen. The year's not over. Look at Romans chapter 5, verse 20. One of the greatest verses on grace. I want you to look at this. It talks about the law and about grace. It says this. Moreover, the law entered that the offense might abound. But... Where sin abounded, grace abounded much more. Let me make sure you understand something this morning. When we're dealing with the law of God, he gave it to Moses in Ten Commandments. He expanded it into the laws in Exodus, Leviticus, and Numbers. You read the laws of God that he established were his people. But let me tell you something about God's law. The Bible says the law of the Lord is perfect, converting the soul. How many know there's nothing wrong with God's law? But the law of God came to reveal sin, not to cure it. The law of God comes to reveal sin, not to cure sin. A lot of people are trying to live out the laws of God in effort to cure themselves, make themselves more right with God, make themselves more pleasing to God, and the law doesn't work. It hasn't worked that way ever for a minute. It didn't work that way for the Jews. It doesn't work for us today. Because the law's purpose wasn't to cure sin. The law's purpose was to reveal sin. Let me break it down this way. Right up over here on Interstate 10, if you start driving, you're not going to drive too far until you see a speed limit sign. The speed limit sign is not there to stop speeding. The speed limit sign is there to reveal speeding. I can prove it to you. How many have ever gone above what the speed limit sign says? Come on, let's just be real today. Right? You've gone above it. How many know that speed limit sign did not limit you from speeding? It just shows you when you look at your speedometer that you are speeding. It tells a police officer when they pull your car over and they compare what your car was going to the speed limit sign, it reveals that you are a speeder, right? It doesn't deal. If there's no regulation, there's no way to break the law because there is no law. If there's no law of God, there's no sin. There's no expectation of God. You can just drive through life like you're on the Autobahn in Germany without limitation. But the moment they put up a sign... The sign reveals the speeder. You hear what I'm saying to you? So what God did in Exodus 4 and in Leviticus when he gave the law is to reveal sin. So when sin comes into existence, it comes because the law shines the light where God draws the line. That's what happens. The law reveals God's expectation. So if I'm trying to work harder and do better to obey the law of God and my nature in me does not have the capacity to do that perfectly, I'm going to end up in a very bad place unless I have a Savior, a Redeemer. This is grace. Do you hear what I'm saying to you this morning? Moreover, the law entered that offense might abound. That the light would shine on where God draws the line. But where sin abounds, grace abounds much more. Think about that for a minute. Where sin abounded, grace abounded more. So before you move into a guilt mode and start looking at this from your personal perspective, wrestling with all the complexities of sin and God's expectation, what I want you to see is that there is a direct correlation 
between sin and grace. Right? Look at this. It is, it's as if wherever sin did its dirtiest work, grace climbed to its highest place. Wherever sin had its worst effect, grace shined its brightest light. That's powerful. It's as if there was something about sin flaunting itself that attracts grace to come and douse out the fire of the raging sin. That's how grace works. So you have to understand there's an absolute correlation between the abounding sin and the abounding grace. King James Version says it this way, for where sin did abound, grace did much more abound. It's powerful. So I want to illustrate this real quick. Mark, come up here. Martin, these, my guys that help me illustrate stuff. And it's good. And so what happens is we're going to let Mark represent sin. All right? You didn't know sin could look so good, did you? Listen, we're going to let Mark represent sin. We're going to let Martin represent grace. How many are glad Martin is grace? Amen? Amen. So here's what happens. I'm going to show you a couple of ways that this works. If I'm walking in the works of my flesh, grace is kind of standing over here somewhere. But I'm not walking in grace. I'm depending on myself. I'm depending on my own strength. So when sin comes to try to attack me or try to grab a hold of me, that's your role, then I'm trying with my efforts to break out of sin. And if I do break out of sin, yeah, with my human effort, I'm wore out. And it's only a matter of time till sin comes and grabs a hold of me again. Because it's right there. So I'm fighting myself by trying and working harder, but it's not doing me any good. So I have an attachment in my life called sin. Right? That's how it works. So, but when sin comes, and I'm not working in my human effort, but I understand how grace works, and I'm walking with grace in my life. All right, so now what happens when sin comes to do every nasty, dirty thing it can to me? When sin comes to try to attack me again, grace comes and stands between me and the sin. And grace says, sin, take your best shot. I can deal with you. And so now instead of my effort dealing with it, grace deals with the sin. Isn't that great? Grace deals with the sin. So how many know, come on back up here, Grace. Now don't call him Grace after the service. I'd be in trouble. But when Grace is next to you when you're walking in grace when you're walking with grace how many know where sin tries to abound grace does much more abound amen grace much more abounds how many know that's how god's grace works in your life how many want to walk with grace amen thank you bro So you're here today not because you haven't failed. You're here today not because you haven't been a flamboyant sinner, but in spite of the darkness of your sin, grace has you covered. In spite of the issues of your life, grace has your back. Now when we think of grace... Let me say something. Let's not limit it to the elementary definition of the unmerited favor of God. I don't disagree with that definition. I totally believe in that definition. I just don't think it fully encapsulates the identity of grace. Because when you reduce grace 
down to the unmerited favor of God, you're dealing with grace as it relates to its redemptive properties. Right? But grace is more than a saving agent. Grace is not just there to save you. Grace is not just there to be a divine Santa Claus that brings God's favor to you. Grace is there to get you somewhere, and grace is also an empowering agent. It comes to empower you. In other words, I have to have grace to pastor this church. I don't have enough ability to do this by myself. I have to have grace to be able to teach you this message today. My wife has to have grace to be married to me. Amen? Don't say amen too loud, baby. Listen, I'm not just saved by grace. I'm empowered to do what God's called me to do by grace. I'm empowered to be who God's called me to be by grace. So I can do what God calls me to do even if I'm not feeling well. Whether I'm feeling good or bad, whether I'm feeling strong today or weary today, whether I'm standing or sitting, whether I'm seeing or blind, because the grace of God is in me to do it. I mean, you can be physically disabled and still do the will of God in your life. But if you're spiritually disabled, you're in trouble. You need God's grace. If God's grace were not on me for what I do, I wouldn't be able to capture the word as much as I'm able to capture it. I wouldn't be able to lead the way I lead. I wouldn't be able to to manage the, the, the pace sometimes that I manage and the things that I'm doing. I can't do all that. I don't have the ability to do all that. I have to have grace. And I need the empowering grace of God to help me walk out the purpose of God in my life. Why am I taking the time to say this? Because your prayer should be, Lord, give me the grace for the challenges I face. Come on, close your eyes and say that. Say, Lord, give me the grace for the challenges I face. Come on, somebody. That's good. Grace is more than forgiveness. Grace is more than salvation. Grace is bigger than favor. Grace is the empowerment of God to function in an area or place that you would be impotent to function in without the grace of God. There's a grace to be a businessman. There's a grace to be a mother. There's a grace to be a husband or a wife. There's a grace to be a pastor. There's a grace to raise a handicapped child. Whatever God has called you to do, whatever you're looking at, facing, walking through, there is grace for you. God's grace enables you to deal with things that not everyone can deal with. That's why you can't allow other people to tell you, if I were you, I wouldn't do that. If I were you, I wouldn't take that. Well, the reality is you can't do that and you can't take that if you don't have the grace for it. So you be you and let me walk in the grace God's called me to walk in. Understand that's how the body of Christ works. Back to that verse, Romans 5, 20. Moreover, the law entered that the offense might abound, but where sin abounded, grace abounded much more, so that as sin reigned in death, Even so, grace might reign through righteousness to eternal life through Jesus Christ our Lord. Let me read that second verse again. Verse 21. So that as sin reigned in death, even so, grace might reign through righteousness to eternal life through Jesus Christ our Lord. Sin reigns in death, but grace reigns in righteousness. I love the way Paul talks about grace in the book of Romans because he takes the weight off my willpower and turns it over to God's power. He goes on to talk about it in chapter 6 and chapter 7. He says in chapter 7, verse 21, he says, Evil is present with me even when I want to do good. How many have ever wanted to do good but didn't do good? It's like there's a struggle on the inside of you. 
I know this is wrong. He said in verse 19, he said, the good I want to do, I don't do. But the evil I don't want to do, that's what I do. Oh, wretched man that I am, how long do I have to endure this body of death? Who will deliver me? Come on, how many have ever felt that way? The things I want to do, I don't do. The things I do, I, I don't want to do, that's what I do. This body, this war that I have going on in the inside of me, who can deliver me? Come on, Paul's not saying this because he's discouraged and depressed. He's saying this because he knows his redemption has to come from a higher power than himself. Right? Why? Because I lack the power inside myself to save myself from myself. I don't have the strength in me to do it because what I want to do, I don't do. What I don't want to do, I do. I have a body of death. I have a war inside my members. Paul talks about this. What he's saying is, listen, you've got to have something stronger than you to enable you to be delivered from the thing that stops you from walking in the purpose of God. At some point, you have to come to a place in your life where you give up on delivering yourself by yourself. So you can experience the power of God to enable you to do what you can't do alone. It's the grace of God that enables you to be free of whatever it is that had you bound. You're delivered by grace. You're free by grace. God has given you grace. Many of you can testify to the delivering power of grace that has enabled you in some places of your life to step out of disgrace and step into grace. Are you hearing me today? What I'm trying to get into you is that as you walk through these various issues and identities in your life, there is grace that you have to be responsible to stay connected to. There's grace in you that you have to be responsible with. You have to begin to build on that grace. So it's not just sitting back in your easy chair while grace does the work. No, it's you working in tandem with grace. Grace enabling you to walk out the purposes that God has given you to walk out. So we have to take it to the next level, right? Come on, hit somebody next to you. Say, build on the grace. Look at Matthew chapter 25. A couple of you look sleepy, so sometimes you got to hit each other, wake them up. Matthew 25. We're looking at Matthew 25. I want to take you to a powerful parable that Jesus taught. And I'm just going to touch on this parable because we don't have time to fully teach it. But I want you to see this parable of a man who issued talents to three of his servants to build with while he was out of town. He actually made a delegated investment of his resources while he was gone. And I don't have the time to teach you, but a talent was an enormous, one talent was an enormous amount of money. It was a huge amount of money. But look at Matthew chapter 25 and verse 14. For the kingdom of heaven is like a man traveling to a far country who called his own servants and delivered his goods to them. And to one he gave five talents, to another two, and to another one, to each according to his own ability. If you underline things in your Bible, I would underline those words. According to his own ability. How many know when God issues you something, he issues you something according to your ability to deal with it? Well, if I only had that opportunity, if I had what he had, if I had the money she has, if I had this, I could really do something with it. Listen, you are appointed what you have the ability to deal with. You have to take what you have and work with that. If you don't, you'll miss the moment of God. God says, be faithful with the little things and I'll make you rule over much. He gave each one according to his ability. And immediately he went out on a journey. Verse 16, then he who had received the five talents went and traded with them and made another five talents. I want you to see what this man did. He built 
built upon what he was given. He built upon what was entrusted to him. That's what I want you to walk away with this morning. With the gift of God comes the responsibility to build on that gift that he's given you. You don't just declare, I'm gifted and sit down. What are you doing with the gift that God has put in you? What are you doing with the abilities that God has given you? If you're going to be an effective leader, if you're going to lead anything we're talking about, you have to learn the art, like this leader did, of delegating his stuff to other people. Why? So it could be built. So that his investment could be working even when he wasn't present. If you're going to build anything bigger than you are, if you're going to be building anything bigger than your own two hands, you have to delegate some of what you have to other people. Right? Some people refuse to delegate. And when you refuse to delegate, what you do is you snuff out the potential to grow to the next level because whatever it is you have will never get any bigger than you. But in the process of delegating, in the process of entrusting, you also have to come back and regulate what has been delegated. A little leadership teaching I'm doing for you right now. Right? Because if you don't regulate what you delegate, things will go wrong. You'll end up in a dilemma. And that brings us to this idea called accountability. Why people that, that kind of run and want to do their own things and they don't entrust themselves to leaders, and they don't follow leaders, and I don't believe in organized church, really the issue is accountability. Really the issue is I want to be delegated, but I don't want to be regulated. You see, this is very important to understand because if I delegate to you, there's a spiritual principle that says to whom much is given, much is required. You can't deal with the greatness of gift without also dealing with the greatness of responsibility. I wouldn't have given it to you if I wasn't expecting you to take it and do something with it. If I wasn't expecting you to take it and build on it. This clearly shows that God expects you to be participatory to the level of gifting that he's put inside of you. You have got to participate with God in the gifts and the callings and the abilities that he has put inside of you. I don't have to be responsible for somebody else's gift. But I do have to be responsible for my gift, right? We have some great worship leaders and singers. I don't have to be responsible for their gift. I, have to, I don't have it, right? I don't have to be responsible for Benny Hinn's gift. That's not my gift. That's his gift. I have to be responsible for the measure of grace that has been allocated to me. So I don't have to waste time competing with other people because we're not comparable. You can't compare me to somebody else because I'm different than somebody else. What God gave me is unique to me. I'm not running against what God did in you. I'm running against what God did in me that I, make, that I can make full proof of my ministry. Say, prove it. You have to prove what's inside of you. You have to prove the grace that God has given to you. You have to deal with the gift that God has given to you so you can get out of this place that you're in and come over to this place and let the grace of God be manifested. So here in this text, we read the subtle expectation of the householder in as much as he had given them talents, we watch them build on what they've been entrusted with. Verse 17. And likewise, he who had received two gained two more also. Now, here's what you don't see in this story. You don't see the guy with the two trying to compete with the guy with the five. Right? He isn't running against the five. It wouldn't be fair because he didn't start with five. He's only going to be judged on what he did with the two. God's not going to judge you on what he didn't give you. Right? He's going to hold you accountable to the level of grace and gifting that you have in you. That's where your accountability is. But whether you're a five or a two, you better build on what you have. You better develop what you have. This is why it's not good to judge somebody else's work. Because everybody operates on different levels of grace. 
And my level of grace and understanding in this area might be a weak area in your life. But you have a level of grace over here that might be a weak area in my life. That's why we need each other and that's why we all need God. We develop the things that are inside of us. Personal focus and humility is what will make you excel. Not focus on what somebody else is doing right or wrong. Besides that, when church people start judging you, they don't just want to look at right or wrong. They want to destroy you. Some of you know what I'm talking about. Verse 18. But he who had received one went and dug in the ground and hid his Lord's money. After a long time, the Lord of those servants came and settled accounts with them. Say regulate. God will always come to regulate what he delegated to you. He will always come to see the fruitfulness of the level that he placed in you. The one who had one talent didn't need to judge himself based on the other. He had to be responsible for his one. Right? And when he wasn't responsible for his one, the master took away his one and gave it to the guy with five. Now, worldly mindsets, we take away from the people with excess and give it to the people that have nothing. In God's kingdom, if you don't bear fruit with what he's giving you, he'll take what you have away and give it to somebody who's done a lot. I mean, no, God's kingdom works opposite of man's kingdom. I'm sure it's getting quiet. Responsibility is my response to my ability. Right? I can't be responsible for somebody else's ability. I can only respond to my ability. That's my responsibility. You have to respond to your ability. That's your responsibility. I can't be responsible for your grace. But I must be responsible for my grace. Otherwise, in the end, I lose what I had, and it will be given to the one who produced the most. That's the parable that Jesus taught. Those aren't my words. Those are Jesus' words. So what I want you to see from this parable is to get from the place where you are, to get from the little to the much, you have to develop what God has given to you. That's your responsibility. You grab a hold of tools. You become accountable with the things that God has put on the inside of you. So you can be fully who God has equipped you to be. So I want to talk to you one last thing, and we're going to come to an end. I want to talk to you about how to unlock this grace on the inside of you. And this is very powerful. How many want to get past the works of the flesh? You want to walk with grace. You want to get into the double portion. Amen? You want to get out of where you've been into a place you've never been before. Do you want that? I'm going to show you how to do it. It's one simple verse. Turn to Jude chapter 1 and verse 20. You could even just say Jude verse 20 because Jude only has one chapter. Those very small books at the end of the New Testament where the gold on your Bible is still stuck together. Right? You got to kind of turn back. It might be easier to start at Revelation and go backwards. Right? Go backwards one page from the beginning of Revelation. And you're in Jude. Jude chapter 1 and verse 20. Only one chapter. So if you ever hear a preacher say, turn to Jude chapter 2, get up and leave the service. Amen? Oh, he's reading from a different Bible. <laughs> Jude 1, verse 20. But you, beloved, building yourselves up on your most holy faith, praying in the Holy Spirit. There's a powerful key here that we're going to end with. I think we live in such an instant microwave age, such an age where we don't like to put forth much effort to do things. We look for other people to build us up. We look for other things to build us up, other experiences to build us up. We do it on every level. On a relationship level, we have a tendency to marry people who we think will build us up. We have a tendency to date people who we think will build us up. We run with friends that we think will build us up. The problem is we put too much expectation on the people, and people don't have the ability to extend grace that you need for that expectation. Only God does. 
then we get frustrated over the years because we're not seeing the development that we want to see. Maybe we don't feel as encouraged as we hope we would be from the relationships we have because sometimes we expect too much from people. The Bible says, you, beloved, building yourselves up. This puts the onus and the responsibility back on you to build up yourself. The benefit is, as you build yourself up, people around you will build you up. Right? Here's the thing. What you see developing in your life will become obvious to the people around you. This is a secret side benefit of grace. It's a side effect. You ever hear, watch the, the commercials about prescription medic, medications and they're reading all the side effects. Well, they have a pretty picture of people walking through the trees and doing things, you know. <laughs> May cause damage to your liver, kidneys, internal organs, or even death could cause suicide. And it's, you know, all these things they're reading, you know, while people are smiling and walking through. Ask your doctor. You could try that. But here's the thing. How many know grace also has some side effects? And one of the great side effects of grace is as you build yourself up, people will build you up. Right? But if you don't build yourself up, let me tell you, people around you won't build you up either. Because they think you like it down there. They do. People ultimately treat you how you treat you. You, you actually treat, you actually teach others how to treat you by how you treat yourself. Walking in your grace will cause others to respond to your grace. You walking in your grace will help and teach others to respond to your grace. That right there was worth coming to church today. Just to hear that one thing. That's powerful, right? Building yourself up is something that you have to do. I can deal with all kinds of things. I could be going through pain and pressure, and I can still push myself to keep going. Even when I'm going through personal struggles, I can still be functional. It's not that I'm crazy. It's just that I learned to build with grace these sea walls against the onslaught of the enemy. I compartmentalize the things that God has called me to do by grace in a way that the enemy doesn't touch it. Right? Sometimes we have to build some personal barriers and gates, not against each other, not against other people, but against the enemy. If you don't have some protective barriers and gates, you'll never accomplish much of anything because everything will just flood in every day. It'll flood in and overtake you. It'll send you so low you can't get up. And I'm not going to that level. Or if I do, I'm sure not staying there. I'll pray about it. I'll think about it. I might even visit the low place once in a while, but I'm not going to stay in a big slump with my lip hanging down under my shoe because I might not be able to get back up from that place if I stay down there too long, right? The fear of not being able to get up keeps me from staying down there. The scripture says the way to build yourself up, the way to construct around yourself a fortress of grace is by praying in the Holy Spirit. We know grace is creating the foundation of faith. What unlocks this thing? What activates it? The Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit is a vehicle that carries you into grace. The Holy Spirit is the vehicle that gets God's grace into your situation. That is the Holy Spirit. Praying in the Holy Spirit. When you pray in the Holy Spirit, though your understanding is not edified, this is not about your intellect. It's about your spirit. Right? Your spirit prays to God, and as you pray in the Holy Spirit, it cleanses your soul. You say, well, I don't understand all this thing about praying in tongues. Praying in tongues scares me. It just sounds like a bunch of syllables. But when you do it, your spirit is making a connection to heaven, and it is building you up. It is prayer in the Holy Spirit that activates grace. One of the greatest things you can do is pray in the Holy Spirit, walk in the Spirit. You come into the place where you're praying in tongues every day. You're driving in your car, you're praying in tongues. You're walking through something, you're praying in the Spirit. I don't know if I, if I start talking in English, 
I might say something I shouldn't say because I'm so angry, I'm so upset, I'm in the flesh. But when I start praying in the Holy Spirit, it bypasses my mind, it bypasses my intellect, and it builds me up. I build myself up by praying in the Holy Spirit. We got to get the junk out of our soul by praying in the spirit. It's got you all heavy. It's got you all down. The devil comes and he'll rob you of days and weeks and months that God has given you. And they're all being wasted worrying about things that you can't fix. Get it out of your soul. Get it out of your emotions. I don't care who died. I don't care what you lost. I don't care what wounded you. There has to come a time and a place where you don't allow the enemy in. Because once you let him in, it's hard to get him out. That's why the Bible says in Ephesians 4, give no place to the devil. Because if you give him an inch, he'll take a mile. If you let him in, I promise you, he will stay, and he will stay, and he's hard to get rid of. So the best way to deal with the devil is don't let him in. Amen? The best way to walk in grace is to give no place to the devil. The best way to do that is to build some protective seawalls around you by praying in the Holy Spirit. To build a foundation of faith. To allow grace to begin to operate in your reality instead of all of the circumstances. And let that begin to control your emotions and your soul. Proverbs 25, 28. You don't have to turn there. It simply says this. It says, whoever has no rule in his own spirit... It's like a city broken down without walls. You have to understand, back in the Bible days, a city was only as strong as the fortress around it. The walls were high and the walls were thick. And the bigger a city and the stronger a city, the bigger its walls. And the bigger its walls, the more protected it was from its enemy. That's why Nehemiah... The very first thing he wanted to do was rebuild the walls of Jerusalem because a city without walls, a city without protective barriers is vulnerable to attacks. How do you build those walls in your life? How do you build that protection around your soul? Praying in the Holy Spirit. Walking in faith. Praying in the Holy Spirit. Walking in faith. I have to rule my own spirit. Trying to rule you can't be my goal. That's, that's called manipulation. I'm not called to rule you. I'm called to rule me. You can rule your own spirit. You can rule those things that try to destroy you. Listen, you have the power in you through the Holy Spirit to stop your own depression, to rule your own mood, to put yourself in a place of stability and stop the onslaught of the enemy. Well, Pastor, I prayed about it. I came to the altar last week. Well, you've got to keep fighting. You've got to keep praying in the Holy Spirit, building up your faith, surrounding yourself with the protective walls. Then you can stop the onslaught of the enemy in your life. Somebody, somebody shout, stop it. Woo! You just rebuke something right then. God's grace in your life is building a fortress called faith. That power that's bringing grace, all those building materials that are coming to you are coming through the Holy Spirit. He's carrying them to you. God's grace in your life, a stable foundation, a protective wall. This grace will stop the enemy's flood from coming into you and bring you into a place like a strong city of stability, of provision, and protection. God's grace is coming to empower you today. I want to read that first verse to you again that I read out of Isaiah 61. Instead of your shame, you will have double honor. And instead of confusion, you will rejoice in your portion. Therefore, in your land, you shall possess double, and everlasting joy shall be yours. Close your eyes with me. Man, I hear the waves of grace crashing into this auditorium today. I hear the waves of grace today. 
speaking into your life. I hear the waves of grace. Holy Spirit, oh Lord, just begin to stir us up in our inner man. Lord, begin to do a work inside of us. Holy Spirit, begin to do a redeeming work. Reform us, God, on the inside. Lord, build the strong walls against the onslaught of the devil. Lord, let us walk in faith. And Lord, let us rejoice in grace today. Come and do something. Some of you sitting here today, you're listening to me speak. God has his hand on your life today. Come on, there's some of you that are strong. You're called to be pillars in your household. There's a men in this place. You're called to be pillars in your household. You're called to be a strong foundation. You felt like I don't have what it takes. Let me tell you, grace will give you double portion beyond what you have in your own ability. There's people watching over the internet right now. God's grace is flowing into you. There's people that are listening to this message. God's grace is coming to you. Come on, some of you sitting here today, you need to get a hold of the grace of God. Some of you have been in disgrace in your life. Some of you have been fighting sin issues and habits and struggles in your life. God wants to bring you into grace today. Trying harder and doing better, you're just going to get locked up again. You need to get a hold of grace today. And grace is coming to stand between you and whatever that issue is that's trying to come against you. Whatever the temptation is. Some of you here today, you've been battling in discouragement. You need to deal with something in your life. You feel like the enemy has taken over you like a flood. He's tried to get into your mind and emotions. You feel like you've been on a spiritual roller coaster up and down and up and down. Grace is here today to bring you into a new place of stability. Today, the grace of God. Let it just begin to wash over you right now. Thank you, Jesus. I just want to ask you, if you would stand to your feet together. Grace. 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 Grace for you today. Oh, Grace. Grace. On. Right now, if you're here and you need to touch into the realm of grace, wherever you're battling, whatever relationship, whatever situation it is today, and your power, your ability is not enough, and you're in a frustrated place today, you need to get a hold of the grace of God. If that's you, I want to pray for you. There's grace for you today. I want you to get out of your seat just like we always do. I want you to come down to the front. I'm not going to embarrass you. We're just going to pray for you. If you need to get a hold of grace today in an area of your life, in an area of your relationship, come right now. Come on, if you feel like you've been in an area of disgrace in your life, somebody has disgraced you, the enemy has disgraced you, today there's grace for you. His grace is sufficient. Whatever you're dealing with today, His grace is sufficient. His grace is sufficient. His grace is able. Come on, the works of my flesh aren't good enough. Let grace stand between you and whatever you're dealing with today. Come on, are you ready? Are you ready to receive from the Lord? Just lift up your hands right now. Come on, if you're at your seats, extend your hands up here. Because there's days we all need grace. Come on, let's just begin to pray right now. The grace of God is coming on you right now. The grace of God in Jesus' name. Grace. Grace on you in Jesus' name. I speak grace over you. Grace. Grace. Grace in Jesus' name. Grace. Beyond your human ability to deal with it. Let it go. Let it go into the hands of God. Grace. Come on, some of you have things that God has given to you to develop. Gifts that God has called you to walk in. Grace right now in Jesus' name. Come on, don't get stuck where you are. Don't get stuck where you are, cycling around the same old thing. Grace for you. Come on, there's something a lot bigger on the inside of you that you realize. Grace on you today. 
Grace, come on church, just pray with me right now. Grace in the name of Jesus to get to the place that God has. Grace, come on, grace over you. Grace over you in Jesus' name. Grace on you in Jesus' Grace, hey, grace in Jesus' name. Oh, grace. Come on, nothing is impossible. Nothing is impossible. Grace. like a shield to cover us with grace oh god oh rabba shiria la ka satarabo shiria oh we praise you lord we thank you lord we honor you god the grace in his eyes the grace, grace is an ocean we're all sinking come on right now just lift your hands up one more time lord i thank you right now for the ocean of grace lord that's going with us from this place today god it's carrying us to a place we've never been lord i thank you that the grace of god is going to overtake every man, every woman, every family, every household, every situation, God. We're going to be overtaken by your grace today. And Lord, you're going to carry us to a place we've never been. So Lord, let us walk out of here today knowing that we're walking in the limitless, unending grace of the Almighty God, the creator of heaven and earth, the creator of us. Breathe into us your life. Breathe into us your grace today. In Jesus' name. Amen and amen. We're going to continue ministering. We won't do a formal dismissal, but I want you to meet somebody you've never met before. 
love them, encourage them, strengthen them. Amen. It's going to be a great week in the name of Jesus.